Welcome, and thank you for joining our ongoing HCG webinar series. I'm Ferris Taylor, Director of uh, the Healthcare Executive Group, and today we will have a, a great discussion around uh, the topic of health policy and the ACA. Before starting, let me mention a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, uh, all attendees will be on mute, so throughout the presentation, feel free to submit questions in the uh, question box or the question button here in go to uh, webinar and we will have time for q a um, in addition the webinar is being recorded and we'll make the recording and the presentation materials available afterwards uh, in addition during the webinar you will see handouts and other resource materials that uh, you can download or or display uh, to facilitate the discussion we are excited to have you join us for this invaluable exchange of information on the state of the ACA marketplace. Health policy and the ACA have been on and off our HCG top 10 list uh, of priorities uh, since prior to 2001 when the Affordable Care Act was passed. But the issues have probably never been more critical than they are right now. And that is why we've scheduled this kickoff uh, uh, session uh, with an excellent panel to, uh, to discuss uh, some of the things that we've learned. At HCG, we focus on practical solutions to HCG top 10 priorities. And we'll be sharing some of those today on the topic of health policy in the ACA. We're a national network of executives and industry thought leaders celebra celebrating 33 years and working together to improve and reshape healthcare. Our mission is guiding healthcare executives through innovation, change, and growth. And we're certainly experiencing a lot of that right now. You can learn more about how we convene, network, and facilitate healthcare by going to hcg.org. But to get us started, let me introduce our colleagues for today's session. And uh, uh, Kevin, if you can put those up. Um, we have uh, Kevin Deutsch from uh, Softion. Uh, Terry Burke and um, and Darnell Dent, and I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves that way, in that order. I'm sorry, Kevin. Excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Deutsch, and I lead the health plan business here at Softion. Been focused very heavily on the ACA for the past seven years, and really grateful to be joined by some veterans in the industry as it relates to the ACA and healthcare in general. So, looking forward to it. Darnell? Hi, I'm Darnell Dent, and I am a principal at the Dent Advisory Services uh, LLC. Uh, it is a strategic uh, management consulting firm that I've established. Um, as you can see, I'm the past CEO of the Community Health Plan in Washington. And more recently, I was the CEO of what is now part of the Beller Scott and White Health Plan, uh, which is uh, First Care. And I'm, I'm pleased to join this panel today and looking forward to the, to, to the discussion. All right. Terry? Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Terry Burke, pleasure to be here with, the, uh, with my colleagues, with the other panelists and facilitators. I'm a healthcare veteran. Prior to my current uh, assignment with Oliver Wyman as a senior advisor in the ACA exchange market. I ran the P&L and was the business lead for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Uh, so we were in that from the very beginning and uh, I'm both a veteran and a new individual. Blue Cross had a big commitment in Michigan to the exchange my current assignment as interim president at AmeriHealth Caritas, they're brand new to the exchange. So both old and new experiences. Terrific, and uh, I'm doing quick math in my head. Uh, so there's uh, 35 or 40 years of ACA and healthcare policy experience, well, ACA experience 
probably 100 years of uh, healthcare policy experience. So uh, this is a great panel and uh, thanks for those introductions, but let's get started. Uh, obviously because of COVID and testing and vaccinations and, and all of that, healthcare policy quickly became a, uh, a priority in 2020. It could, had actually fallen off the list just a bit uh, over the years, uh, but then in 2021 with the change of administration, uh, again, healthcare and ACA policies and priorities uh, have changed even more dramatically. Um, uh, HCG, with our technology partners, in, including Softion, uh, have facilitated uh, nine small group roundtables uh, to gather member and thought leader insights on critical issues. And uh, so let me get started summarizing the three roundtables that we've had over the last uh, uh, six months on healthcare policy and the ACA. And the common theme across these three roundtables, and you'll be able to have the slides and the details, so I won't uh, go through all of, uh, all of the bullet points, but the thing that I saw when I sort of step back and summarize these is the word change. The first roundtable was, uh, gosh, we need more agility to respond to health policy. And change is kind of the new normal that we were facing. And then more specifically in the second round table, uh, we started getting into the things that were changing, not just with respect to the ACA and the regulations and the lawsuits and all the challenges going back and forth, but we had the American Rescue Plan and its implications in, in terms of policy and especially the exchange. We had the regulations around interoperability and, and patient access to data and price transparency and, and the No Spur Surprises Act was uh, starting to be discussed. And by the time we got to the third round table, the, the change that was being discussed was very much starting to focus on, on, on technology and what it's going to take and how it's going to impact our ability to keep current and be agile and, and respond to, to the changes and challenges. And we see more of that change coming uh, in the future in terms of the infrastructure bill. Not a lot in there with respect to healthcare, but I would say just as we need to repair roads and, and bridges, we need technology, uh, broadband, and, and new ability to deal with the digital age that healthcare has, has moved into. And we have the ongoing discussions around the reconciliation bill. And, and it seems like daily there's, there's change that's involved there as well. Uh, and that will be embedded completely into government funding and the debt ceilings. And, and just today I've seen things uh, there. So with all of that, there are, there's change, there's opportunities. I think in many ways, um, uh, challenges that hopefully this panel today will help us discuss. I know Darnell, you have been able to participate in a number of these roundtables, as as have you, Kevin and 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 Terry. But uh, Darnell, why don't you kick us off in terms of sharing what changes you anticipate in light of your years in ACA and and what it means in terms of consumerism and technology and digital health and everything else. So start us off, Darnell. Well, first of all, I'm I'm actually very excited about this year because having started when the ACA uh, first launched, um, especially for health plans in 2013, um, we didn't have nearly the, the the information nor the technology or the supports to actually do the job that we had before. So we used what we knew at that time and we applied the that knowledge to the marketplace, which, as you know, as it played out, uh, had all kinds of disastrous uh, uh, results. One, uh, companies lost a lot of money. Uh, members weren't really sure about coverage. In the background, we had the government that was not necessarily supportive of the ACA. And therefore, and in fact, many people had painted the ACA as just sort of being a whim, something that was just sort of passing that it really didn't fit. And uh, with all that noise, we had an environment that was set for failure. However, because of the health plan's commitment to members and commitment to healthcare, uh, many of the companies forged ahead. And then there was a period of time 
that there were players who decided, hey, we've had enough, and they actually bailed out, um, and they, they refocused their attention on other segments of their business. But fast forwarding that, we now find ourselves where things are starting to change. We see that the, there's more of a, a foundation from, from the federal government supporting the ACA. In fact, the Biden administration has made that a central part of, 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 of their healthcare policy. And that is of making sure that there's available coverage and the marketplace uh, is one of, those, one of those avenues. Then we saw that Congress with this passing that $1.9 trillion co coverage relief package under the American Rescue Plan, that really started to shift what I think the future that gave everyone more confidence that, hey, look, this is something that may have some staying power. And as a result of that, we started to see other things play come into play. While it didn't have um, a, a lot of impact, the fully the full subsidization of COBRA sent a very strong message to the market that healthcare was something that, that, uh, that we all supported. But uh, the main point that I wanna drive, and then I know Kevin and others will, will jump in and, and actually have this, this discussion. I think today we are seeing what is shaping up this open enrollment period to be probably the most competitive that we've ever seen. We're seeing former players who are now jumping back in. Uh, we're seeing those who have played expanding their markets. We're seeing partnerships. In fact, there was a Cigna partnership announced with Oscar to offer a jointly, um, a jointly uh, funded endeavor with his first plan. We know that Cigna's expanding its markets. We know that Edna's returning uh, back to the market and they've been out since 2018. You're seeing, we're seeing United Healthcare adding additional states. And so with all of that lining up, I expect that we're gonna see a very competitive marketplace, not only from product offerings, but I think we're gonna see uh, more plans that are willing to, to offer a more competitively priced ACA product than we've ever seen. So that's just sort of the tone as as sort of as I see sort of the the, uh, the way things are developing, but I would be curious to hear more from Terry and from from Kevin in terms of their perspectives on it. But the headline here is I think we're in for the most competitive ACA open enrollment that we've we've seen since the very beginning. Excellent, Darnell, and I I think that that competitive message was at the heart of the ACA from the beginning. Uh, yeah. My own experience was one of the co-ops and, you know, the intent was bring more competition to the marketplace uh, for many reasons. And uh, in addition, and I know we'll come back to it, uh, uh, it, it, not just the experience that consumers have had with the Affordable Care Act, but uh, what COVID has exposed over the mm -hmm. last 18 months in terms of the disparities and the inequities and the inaccessibility and and all of that. Uh, Kevin, I, I, I know we appreciate uh, you bringing uh, together this graphic. Uh, talk to it just a bit. And, and Terry, uh, you and Kevin can can sort of facilitate a discussion here on lessons learned as we've gone through this roller coaster ride. Absolutely. And thank you, Ferris and Darnell, for the insight here. And I, I really think there's a tremendous opportunity in the ACA marketplace. And as you can see, there was a significant concern in the beginning of the ACA about financial viability, and you saw many plans exit the marketplace, and now you're seeing quite a few come back in. And I know, Terry, you are right in the thick of things right now as you're working with a Medicaid plan to get into the marketplace, but maybe passing it over to you, you know, this picture seems a lot different now than it did many years ago when you had first gone through this ACA marketplace experience. Tell us about some of the, the key differences from where you were back then to, to what things look like now. Yeah, so thank you. And, and uh, I, I just wanted to start off by saying it's a pleasure to be here. And 
Darnell, your opening comments, I could not agree more. I think we're headed for likely the most competitive wave of exchange business that we've ever seen coming up with this open enrollment and probably the next several that follow. I can recall all the way back to the beginning, just like Darnell uh, at the organization I worked at at the time, we spent three years uh, preparing and committing to that open enrollment. Everything was a challenge. Many organizations that were insurance carriers and payers got in and it looked exciting after the first year, even though everything didn't work. You can see the second year, even more came in and that started to decline as folks began to maybe not have the experience in retail healthcare to appropriately price. They weren't able to chase the charts for risk adjustment to help stabilize the market. Lots of challenges with the exchange. And then at one point, the cost share subsidies that were part of the law were taken away. And you saw some of the big carriers really, uh, that's when the market troughed down to that 181 number. And little by little, it's been coming back. And to Darnell's point, you've seen the big players, the national players, as well as many locals and the Medicaid business, as well as technology-based carriers are all starting to get into the mix. In fact, one of the things that I would add here is on some of the publicly traded companies, you hear them now introducing a new set of terminology, calling it overlap counties. So organizations that have large tranches of Medicaid business, COVID really revealed this with vulnerable populations and lots of challenges for deferred maintenance on care and people being able to get to the doctor. <clears throat> There's lots of jumping in and out of Medicaid and ACA business. So I think you're gonna see a little bit of that, uh, what was it Darnell, at one point we had a conversation and we talked about the very beginning of ACA was like the, the old tales of the Wild West, you know, sort of anything goes. I think you're gonna see a frenetic pace to your point on the competition coming up in the next open enrollment. That's right. And, and as we talk about the competition here, and, and Darnell may be interested in, in your insight as well, on how are plans positioning themselves in the marketplace? There might've been a very different strategy back in 2013, 2014 than the strategy is now. So maybe Darnell or Terry, if you could share some insights on how somebody getting into the marketplace may be positioning their plan with this increased competition? Well, I'll make a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, I think there, there are more resources today, and I think we, we learn from history, so I think plans have had an opportunity to observe what has been happening, and they have taken note, and they have uh, gone to school on pricing, and actuaries have had a chance to really gear up and and really take the, the nuances in exchange and apply that to the pricing formula. And to Terry's point about these overlap counties, there are overlap products that, that plans have been able to just sort of draw from in terms of, of profile and who are these people and what do they really need. And so I, I think that's, that's one of the areas that, that, that we are seeing Com uh, companies get more more comfortable with what they're they're getting into. Terry, so so thank you, Darnell. I, great comments, and uh, I think one of the things I would probably stress is that everything at the beginning of uh, ACA, when it first started, felt like an experiment. Mm -hmm. We invested lots of money in computer simulations, and we invested lots of money in consumer research to try to help understand what is it that a consumer needs or wants. And I think we found out <clears throat> that there was an awful lot of education that needed to be required. And uh, the panelists have heard me say this before, I'll say it out loud. I think oftentimes as an industry, we haven't done the best of jobs in in uh, making sure that we ha that we are advocates for consumers. This is really complex stuff. 
And I think we owe it to the consuming population in this retail market, whether they float in and out of Medicaid or they come from uh, out of the group environment into providing their own coverage or they're a small business owner, whatever the case might be, this is very complex stuff. More and more competition will take place, but I will go back as a new entrant through the AmeriHealth Caritas effort, which is a Medicaid-based organization, to compare it to some of the things that I did eight years ago. If I had a chance to go back and do that over again, as a Blue Cross plan, I wouldn't have had so many choices. I wouldn't have introduced so many products. We introduced products at all metal tiers, including platinum, lost a lot of money on those, had to pull back. And that's an abrasion point when you do that to a consumer. At one point, we had PPO products, HMO products, narrow network HMO products, and products that were specific to singular provider health plans. So all in all, at one point in one state, we probably had 46 or 47 individual verticals, I'll call it, across those metal tiers. Way too much for a consumer to absorb, and then they have to compare that with other plans. This time around, we went a, a whole lot skinnier or slimmer on that to try to make it easy or easier for a consumer. You can choose from these five or six sets of plans. I think those are some of the things that if you're a new entrant getting in, uh, slimming things down and making things easy to process so that you're easy to do business with would be very appropriate in a really amped up competitive market. The other thing I'll just say quickly is, I hope that as we move this forward and things get competitive with networks, with um, geographic areas, it always leads in retail to what's the price? What's gonna be the price before and after subsidy? Just that is a complex situation to unpack for a consumer. And I hope that as we enter into this new round of really intense competition, that organizations are smart about sustainability, that they don't buy business and then have to jack up rates in some sort of a catch up rate across a two or three year span. Things have been relatively stable with pricing over the last two or three years. I hope uh, that we all keep it that way for the good of the consumer and the marketplace right now. Just you know, to Tara, add, very, oh, go ahead, Darnell. Yeah, I just wanna make this point because I, I, I really love uh, what Terry is saying in terms of the focus on the consumer. You know, here's a business that's been so focused on employer-based type coverage, and now to see that shift that we now have the, the consumer at the center and we're concerned about meeting individual needs as opposed to meeting the needs of a large employer or of a company benefit program. But I just wanted to interject that because I think that is also one of the, one of the marked shifts that we're seeing with the ACA. And just to, to augment that, Terry and Darnell, I, there there was definitely that uh, early period of the ACA with the enrollment like that, where uh, there was, as you said, Terry, buying business. Uh, and unfortunately, it was the larger health plans that had the financial cushion to be able to survive that. There were a lot of uh, smaller uh, plans that uh, could not survive that. But, but in fact, when we went out and research those consumers, it was the non-consumer, uh, the the, the non-customer of insurance that was coming into the marketplace for the first time. And there was a lot of education. Experience has been the, the great educator, but uh, I, I think now we're seeing this transition to healthcare really becoming what healthcare should be. Uh, during the trough there, when the number of uh, health plans available uh, was taking place. I know at least in the state that uh, uh, Arches was based in, uh, we had 26 counties where there was only one uh, insurance plan 
that mm. offered individual coverage. That's not choice. Uh, and even if that one plan, Terry, uh, offered uh, 50 different versions, it was still one plan with, uh, without the competition that needed to be there. So uh, my only other question, and, and Darnell and, and, and Terry, you both had experience in that, is that part of the ACA uh, also had states expanding Medicaid. And I know discussions with Chris Condolucci and others that were involved in the formation with the Senate Finance Committee to, to formulate the Affordable Care Act. It never crossed their mind the states wouldn't expand Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if our experience is dramatically different in the states that didn't expand Medicaid versus the states that did and how that's going to change in this next round of of healthcare policy with respect to the administration encouraging and supporting the expansion of medicaid at the same time expanding the availability of the aca individual and small group plans any thoughts there darnell you want to yeah, I uh, one because I live in one of those states where I. By the way, I, I live in in Texas, and uh, our our ACA uh, play comes through the federally uh, the federal program, and um, while there's regional support for the ACA just from an overall state standpoint, it is it is one where we are more focused from what the government is going to be able to provide and, and, and be able to drive um, uh, you know, meeting the needs of those members. But I think that Medicaid uh, will be affected, especially because it will shine a light on the things of, of, of the various needs that it, at the various levels, and especially for those individuals who don't qualify for Medicaid, and I'm speaking primarily, for instance, in our state, is primarily uh, women and babies. Those are other individuals that may be below the poverty line or, or maybe just above that, where there is a particular need, there's a great need for providing a level of assistance. And the ACA, ACA I think, provides that vehicle. So finding funding, whether it be from Congress, or on a local basis, I think that's very critical to, to help them meet that meet that challenge. Yeah, good, great comments. I, I, I think, uh, Ferris, that, that maybe one way to think about uh, Medicaid expansion as it relates to ACA, and it's always gonna be uh, a state-by-state -state policy issue, but in those states where it expanded, um, it actually makes the the individual market just a little bit smaller. Folks are taken care of. Somewhere uh, within the law, we have had this gap uh, that there's a there's a little window of individuals between whatever it is 100 and 138 percent of federal poverty level that that actually sort of don't qualify for. Uh, the ACA program. So I think it's going to be interesting to see with this particular administration, Biden was part of the original Obamacare uh, architecture, framing and scaffolding to see how this sort of pegs itself back up as we move along, because <clears throat> it's almost like a continuum of care opportunity uh, that, that's going to wind up being state by state. Medicaid takes care. Some people don't qualify or they float in and out. ACA should be there uh, to make, make sure that those folks have access to quality and affordable coverage. And by the way, just a side note on all of this, before uh, wh whatever your politics are um, and, and whatever your depth of, of thinking is about uh, some people actually call it Obamacare, but the Affordable Care Act, especially individual exchange business, before this started, this was a different form of the Wild West. Individual business was underwritten. Some right. people couldn't qualify. Uh, if you could qualify and you had a chronic condition, rates got jacked up really high and organizations 
that were ruthless about the money could drop you if you had a health condition. There were annual limits, there were lifetime limits. And so those policies were very different. The individual coverage with 10 essential health benefits, and I think we we've, we've sort of uh, maybe need to get brilliant on the basics again, it's the same as the small group business. And so what they were trying to do was to make sure that much of the coverage was as comprehensive as possible. Right. So I think that's a key point as we move this forward. And as we continue to talk about eliminating some of the gaps between Medicaid and, and marketplace and, and some of the changes that the Biden administration has introduced, such as the extended special enrollment period from February all the way out to August, or the American Rescue Plan Act, increasing the subsidies and reducing that subsidy cliff, as they call it. And now, released just as of Friday, is extending open enrollment to January 15th for the federal exchange this year. So based on those changes, any immediate reactions? Maybe we'll start on the, the subsidies. Is this something that we think is here to stay? How are plans sort of thinking about these increased subsidies and what it may mean to their membership and, and the organization in general? Darnell or Terry, you want to take a first pass? Well, I think that, I think the subsidy piece really speaks to the the affordability issue that we've been trying to trying to figure out. And I think it's a necessary component. And I and I also believe that for as a country, the subsidy and and the degree that we're able to do that starts to move us in a direction where uh, healthcare is not just a, a market, but it's it's a it is all and an industry. It is also par, uh, directly connected to public health. And if you put this under the public health umbrella, then that means that uh, government has a responsibility to make sure that one people are able to get health care, but then secondly, that it that is done in such a way that they are able to to participate in those programs. So as this evolves, the subsidies, I think, will be become more of a fixture. It's not going to be a, a quick fix. You take it away, the program collapses. Okay. So as Congress uh, looks at the whole fin financing of, of the program, having a, a graduated subsidy program and a go along with the type of products that are offered and services, I think is going to be a very critical decision that we're going to have to pivot to. Yeah, agreed. A, a couple of things to, to do a yes and on Darnell's good comments. It, it's something of the order of, of 85 to 90 percent. It's a little different state by state of, of individuals on the exchange qualify for a subsidy. Uh, and it ranges between two thirds and as much as all of someone's premium is paid through a subsidy by the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, those that what struck me, Darnell, about what you said was the, the, the program would collapse without the subsidies. That's absolutely true. Uh, Health care rises every year at a much faster rate than other things from an inflationary standpoint. Uh, procedures are expensive and the health care premiums reflect that clearly. So the subsidies allow that safety net for many people to be in on this. That's the first part. The second part is the removal of what uh, is commonly referred to as the subsidy cliff, where the subsidies got expanded and it's sort of a graduated uh, effort that's almost like a step down as income rises. Uh, you've gotten so much broader that a lot more folks will go ahead and apply for coverage that might not have been able to afford it in the past. So I think that is an expansion of who joins the individual exchange and having a robust exchange creates competition, it creates affordability, it creates innovation so that we all focus on doing the right thing for the consumer and being easier to do business with, continue to provide that 
that closed loop system, if you will, of quality healthcare as a, at an as affordable price as we can possibly muster. And I think there's proof in the fact that during this special enrollment period, over 2.8 million new consumers joined the exchange. So that could be a combination of factors from increased marketing efforts from the administration. As you know, during the Trump administration, they really did away with all marketing. They shortened the open enrollment time period to now with the American Rescue Plan Act, increased subsidies. So there is truly an increased value that's out there and an increased awareness to these consumers considering the enrollment. Now let's look at the other side of this for, for just a second here, because we have the extended special enrollment period that went all the way through August. We have open enrollment coming up on November 1st that's now extended through January 15th. So are there any adverse effects of some of these things that the administration is doing? Is extending this window, giving it a little bit, making it a little bit more difficult for health plans to be able to continue to operate and make sure that they're effective being able to serve their members. Any challenges that you could think of there, Terry? I'll start so, with you. So, so I think, you know, when you take this all, again, a historical context, sometimes good. When you take this all the way back, the very first open enrollment started October 1st, okay. it ran through the end of March, it got extended to April, and then it got extended to uh, uh, April 15th. So it was really, really broad. Uh, then it, for several years, it was three months. And I can tell you back in those days, when you look at the data, there was, um, there was an enormous amount of, I almost hate to say it, but I will, consumer procrastination, <laughs> where you had until midnight of the 15th to sign up uh, so that you your policy would effectuate for the next uh, first of the of the month, and we saw a huge amount of rush. So there was bubble staffing that had to be put on in a real collapsed or short period of time. When we move to six weeks, it almost feels like it's not enough time. And one of the things of expanding this in an additional thirty days, I think that is. Uh, a real sign of empathy from this administration to to the fact that we've gone through quite a year and vulnerable populations are even more at risk and have so many other life events and social determinants of health outside of selecting health care. Let's give them some additional time. Now, I would say a little bit of that additional time is blunted by the time of year. Normally, December 15th, it's a holiday season, so a lot of people don't do much focus other than family between the 15th and the end of the year, and then there's another 15 days or so after that. I, I think from a system standpoint, there's a little bit of a hiccup because with the November 1st to December 15th, if we just look at it from a business standpoint, everybody's on the same open enrollment period or the same effective date period. Um, if you move it to the middle of January, you're going to have a couple of different periods, a little bit of a pain point and opportunity uh, in, increases for error. But I think that's a good thing that we've expanded the time frame right now. And I also think that expanding the time frame helps us smooth out the wrinkles in enrollment. I mean, quite frankly, there are a number of people who who would who qualify for the ACA uh, moving to find someone to help them get enrolled, whether it's a broker or there's some organized some organizational community where there are enrollment affair uh, enrollment fairs. Those are those are ways to help people who really need it get enrolled. And then on the back end, and we started the conversation out talking about some of the advancements in with technology, what that's going to do, make it available via a portal system, whether it be from the health plans or whether it comes um, by way of Softion with this capabilities around portals and getting people accustomed to going in and being able to enroll themselves and having enough information so that a, per, a, a reasonable person can make the choice 
for their individual needs is another thing. And, and it's difficult for us who are professionals in this industry to kind of figure it out. So you can imagine how difficult it is for someone who's not really familiar with copays and deductibles or when there's a fee on this thing or other types of things. So I think that's another element to give people time to get enrolled and get into the right program that meets their needs. Now, and, uh, building on that, uh, Darnell and Terry, uh, we have a question that came in and I want to encourage everyone on to submit their questions so we can, we can uh, respond to them. But the procrastination and the time that it takes, the question that came in was, how do we improve the messaging? So many people are uninsured and don't know the options available to them. Any uh, perspectives? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that you, you actually really saw, uh, again, not not trying to bring politics into it, but but it's but it's hard not to at times. Uh, when you saw the the marketing and advertising budget that came from the federal government uh, eliminated on this for an open enrollment or two or three, <laughs> um, I think there was a marked difference in people's acknowledgement of it because it's it's sort of the old adage within organizations, what gets measured gets done. And I think in the consumer business, oftentimes what gets seen and made aware, people will inquire about, become more inquisitive of its top of mind and they'll they'll search for answers and they'll search for help. And so, I think one of the things that uh, we need to do in addition to having a, having good technology partners, as, as Darnell said, to make this as easy as possible with portals or online quoting um, self-enrollment is we need to make people aware of what their options are. Probably two or three years old, but a, a Kaiser uh, a monthly research poll indicated during, right before and during one of the open enrollment periods, um, it was something like 40% of ACA eligibles didn't know when open enrollment started, when it was going on, didn't know it was going on, and actually thought there was a difference between individual health care and Obamacare is what a lot of folks use that casual term. And so I think both the government and the industry um, still have plenty of runway to improve on educating the consumers about what their options are, as well as providing good options. And Darnell, and great feedback, Terry. And Darnell, you had called out the brokers in particular. Brokers play a significant role for many health plans that navigate the ACA marketplace. And I was just on a panel last week with CMS with over 750 agents and brokers that are looking to start to sell plans on the ACA. And basically, you know, there's still a lot of education that needs to be done out to the brokers and the agents and tools to be able to efficiently enroll these individuals into plans. So I'm interested to hear your, your thoughts, Terry, Darnell, about getting the brokers engaged and what are some of the ways that, that you as a health plan can work with these brokers and help them facilitate some of these enrollments? Terry, I don't know if you want to take a first pass at that one. Sure, I'll, I'll take a first pass. I, I think in my experience, my 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 first turn of the crank on this for, for eight open enrollments uh, with a blue plan was when we looked at all the information in terms of enrollment uh, entry or enrollment venue, it came pretty close to a third, a third, a third. And what I mean by that is a third of the folks either got on the company website or uh, went directly to the exchange and enrolled themselves. Uh, a third of the folks phoned in through uh, different organizations that we were contracted with that actually were licensed brokers, but it was over the telephone. And a third went through a, a brokerage or an independent broker that uh, was appointed with the organization. As time has moved forward, 
the the broker industry. And at one point there were people that said, oh, the brokers are the, the broker industry is going to be disparaged. It's it's not needed. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I think some very own CMS statistics that they pushed out, uh, it's a little bit different in each state, but it's something on the order of 60% of the business that comes through, comes through a broker. The difference these days is brokers have savvied up on the technology and they're, they're bringing people into ACA through their own online portals. In, in many cases, those are through Zoom conferences, that they've had with clients in order to get them enrolled on the exchange. So the brokers are an absolute imperative for success, I do believe, and having great relationships with brokers and brokerages is a key to making sure that you treat the consumer right. And, and many, many people need somebody to talk to, a trusted mm -hmm. advisor. If it's not a navigator, it's gonna be a broker. And I agree, Terry. I mean, the brokers live; they live in the communities. Uh, they're they're easily accessed in terms of, you know, maybe at the grocery store or meeting meeting outside of uh, the office where someone can say, "By the way, you know, I need to look at my insurance. When is open enrollment? Or how do I go about doing that?" So I think that gives just that that other level of of depth that really can help uh, individuals find um, what they need, especially in the marketplace. And, and I do think that um, with the dynamics of marketplace at, at this point, uh, one of the things that I've noted is the fact that it's going to require that we spend more time and think more about year round uh, participation in these types of types of programs. I don't see us evolve into it just yet, but the reality is uh, the needs are such that expanding open enrollment, I think is, a, is, a, is good, but at the same time, we may come to a point someday where uh, individuals may be able to sign up maybe on a, on a quarterly basis or some, some along, something along those lines, just because the need is just so great and and uh, making that available to, to people more frequently might be the answer. And we're just about a minute before we transition into Terry's top 10, as we're calling it, some of his lessons learned from prior experience. Before we do that, I wanted to ask one question as it relates to enhanced direct enrollment. This is a major concept that was released over the past few years that wasn't available, Ferris, Darnell, when you all, and then Terry at the Blues Plan, when you all had first gotten into the marketplace. Any brief comments on what enhanced direct enrollment actually brings as far as the value to the health plan, the consumer, the broker? There really is a ton of value there. Maybe we could share from, from your perspective the improvements as a result of EDE as opposed to that you know classic double redirect and having to go out to healthcare.gov. Darnell, do you have any insights that, that you can share as it relates to EDE? I can tell you that the, the simpler we can make things, the better. I mean, that's always general, the, the, good, the, the rule. And having to go through another iteration of steps just complicates matters. And I frankly believe that EDE will be, will be the norm in time just because it, it simplifies and it makes it so much easier. Plus, as the government really considers this role and how it's going to and how it's going to play, you know, allowing allowing EDE to really take the, the lead, I think, is is a, a place where it needs to go. And so from from my standpoint, I wish I had access to that during my health plan days. And it would have been the preferred method as far as I was concerned. Terry, any follow-up comments? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, all of the original effort uh, it was really sort of cumbersome or clunky, certainly not consumer friendly, created a lot of frustration, heartache and abrasion, all that uh, uh, come, come to our site. Now we have to go to the government site. Now we have to come back so that we can finish the enrollment. Um, that was definitely a challenge. So, so, so from a from a from a company standpoint, a carrier or insurer standpoint, you 
uh, especially in the intensity that we're in now uh, with competitive density and intensity amping up, you work hard to acquire that member. And the last thing you want is for that member, you know, welcome them in the front door and the back door is open. So enhanced direct enrollment allows you to build a relationship with that customer, even when you are going through the enrollment process. I'll tell you a, a, a very quick uh, story on that early on. We remember at the beginning of all this, before it was so technology and innovative driven, you had to actually effectuate a three-way call with healthcare.gov. And on several uh, recordings I listened to, one of my very own call agents had spent a long time educating this, this mother and her two children who you could hear in the background on the call. We had to connect with healthcare.gov and our agent is on the line and stays with them the whole way. And the healthcare.gov agent says, well, ma'am, I see a Humana plan here that's uh, less expensive. Uh, you sure you don't want to enroll in that? And it's like, well, wait a second. Uh, you know, I'm with a I'm with a competitor, and I'm all for uh, free choice. But but uh, you know, let's get back let's get back to where we are. So enhanced direct enrollment allows that process to be maintained by the organization. And I think it's important that you that you acknowledge that. The other on the consumer side, man, it just makes it so much easier. So to Tarnell's point, the simpler the better. And I think we're there. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, with just a few minutes left here, and we have to share this slide and, and allow Terry a, a few minutes here to share some of his lessons learned from his prior experience at a blues plan to where he is now working with AmeriHealth, Caritas, and just his overall thoughts about where the marketplace is going. So Terry, I'm gonna give you the floor here to maybe take the audience through some of those lessons learned and how the things that you've gone through, you can maybe help another plan that's out there listening to today's presentation. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I'm gonna treat this like the, the lightning round. There, there's 10 things here that, that are sort of sound bited up. And, and the first one is start early. And what I mean by that, in, in my most recent experience, there's a need to take an organization that's Medicaid-based and make sure that they get an HMO certificate of authority so that you can operate as a commercial carrier. That is a lengthy process. Uh, a provider network in the commercial business is a lengthy negotiating process. That needs to be unpacked over a year or so, sometimes more. So starting early, really important. Second one, if you're gonna start early, you gotta go long and you gotta think about entry and expansion on the marketplace is a significant investment for any organization. If you're new to this, hold on to yourself. There needs to be a high tolerance for unknowns, uncertainty, risk, and volatility and you should be thinking or explaining to your leadership and your board, this is probably a two to five year maturation process and payback before your startup investment starts to get covered. Number three was friends in high places. And that means if you work for a carrier that has decided from a strategic planning standpoint, they're commercial in nature, mostly group, and you're gonna go into the individual market or you're a Medicaid player and you're going to expand into the individual market. It makes all the sense in the world, but you need to have friends in high places, meaning that expansion becomes a strategic initiative. You've gained alignment or sponsorship from a leadership individual so that you can navigate your way through the culture. The fourth one, secure local market expertise. I don't think this one could be stressed enough that every, while this is the Affordable Care Act at the federal level, every state is different. Every state has its own set of uh, idiosyncratic managed care rules and regulations. Some of them peacefully coexist with ACA. Some of them collide. Some of them are more strict. So finding local expertise in the ACA or managed care legal and compliance area on a state-by-state -state basis 
extremely important. Knowing your community resources in the community, not just in a state, but in boots mm -hmm. on the ground, zip code, block level, really important. And connecting those community leaders with your prospects is a mark to the market opportunity that we all have at the local level. A recent experience I had is uh, number five, regulators are people too. Darnell nailed it at the beginning. We're headed into high intensity for competition. And as a result, think about all of your filings. You have to file a QHP with the state. You have to make sure you get a certificate of authority before that. You're gonna file lots of legal documents, lots of constraints and restrictions on what's required somebody at the state department of insurance has to review all that in every state they have stretched budgets they have limited amount of people but now they've got more applications to review so we need to have a little bit of compassion for those regulators and we need to be patient with them because they're going to be under heavy stress and are working very very long hours the sixth thing was Inside the organization, and I've heard this term used before, is, oh, we, we want to go into the ACA business, so we sort of treated it like a project. And what that means is it's added on like an after work effort, or it's on the side of the desk. And uh, if you're going to start into the ACA business or you're expanding your ACA effort, it's not a side of the desk effort. It really requires a uh, full-time team and a commitment across your entire organization so you can have successful execution. I think we owe that to the consumers, the providers, and the brokers that we partner with and that we serve. The seventh one was you have to draft a core team that has what I call both know-how and cultural fit. So um, that's an acronym I picked up along the way of trying to build a culture of heroes which stands for highly empowered retail operatives. And you should make sure that your heroes all get a vote because they will represent the voice of the consumer. So the vote acronym that I use is voice of the empowered. And those empowered consumers are focused, or those empowered employees are focused on your consumers. Number eight was partner up. So for, for me personally, uh, Kevin Deutsch and his team at Softion have been enormous partners. Uh, technology, it's an end-to-end -end platform. It's worked really well. My first time around, uh, my big organization tried to build or custom retrofit a lot of systems, and it was pricey, it was clunky, it was difficult, and uh, didn't always work in the consumer's best interest. So partnering up with high technology as well as other focus, uh, folks that really understand the consumer journey is very important. This one is of great interest to me. Number nine, risk adjustment is a game changer because if you are able to ensure that you get people to the doctor, the doctor appropriately codes their conditions you get that information back and you submit it appropriately to the federal government, you will maximize your revenue in the QHP exchange business. If you maximize your revenue, it'll drop right to the bottom line and you can run a sustainable business at a reasonable margin and actually grow and expand to help more people. So risk adjustment is a game changer in terms of how you run an exchange P&L. And the last thing is we all have to meet them, you know, what I call meet the member in the moment, the customer journey in the individual exchange. It's very complex. It's very confusing. We talked about it. Being a partner for the member at every step of their process is if you're in this business, I feel an obligation as well as a key uh, to sustainable success. And I think all of us are responsible for meeting all members' needs in the moment of their choice that they make of who they're gonna work with and how things are gonna work out for them within the budget that they have. So that's the quick lightning round for the top 10 list if you're deciding to go into the business or you're already in the business and gonna expand.
That and was, Terry, I think your last point was the, the excellent one. We started out talking about change in consumers and you've taken us through that and ended with meet the member in the moment, which I think is a, a, a great, uh, great way to bring the webinar to a close. Uh, we have some additional slides with uh, some, uh, some resources to help. I think this is in our link, uh, Kevin, in terms of how to seamlessly enter uh, the expanded uh, ACA marketplace. I don't know if you have any additional comments there, but it's available. We'd love to give the group a copy. Anyone who's interested to take a look at our white paper to memorialize some of the topics that we've discussed here today. There's a lot of really good content for plans getting into the marketplace and those that may have been around for a little while. So feel free to reach out for a copy. And I think we've covered the uh, Q&A slide. Uh, we have our, our contact information again. Uh, just in closing, we have uh, some upcoming um, uh, HCAG webinars and additional roundtables. The topics and the, uh, the dates are on this slide, but you can go to hcg.org and uh, see all of those uh, register. We invite you to participate in these discussions. And, and finally, I, I want to thank all of you who have been on the, uh, uh, the webinar today for this discussion. We wish you the very best in getting out to uh, getting onto the Affordable Care Act, uh, the ACA marketplace. And uh, you have our contact information. Any of us, all, of, all four of us would be glad to uh, engage and answer questions. And finally, uh, join us. Uh, we do year round networking and learning through lots of different mechanisms. Uh, please uh, reach out. Uh, we want to especially thank uh, you, Kevin, and, and Eugene and Softion for uh, the participation with HCG, for the sponsorship, and for putting together this excellent discussion. Uh, for all of you, have a great day. And for uh, Kevin, Terry, and Darnell, thank you so much for sharing your insights and, uh, and experience. It has been invaluable. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Ferris. Thanks, everybody.